So when you think about agriculture, our bottom line really is to feed the world, right? And to do that, to feed the estimated 9 billion people by 2050, we have to significantly increase our productivity uh, in terms of food generation if we're going to be able to feed the world. Purdue University has a research facility dedicated to finding better ways to farm by increasing yields and improving efficiency. The bottom line is to figure out a way to feed the world. Uh, we're talking about big data, connected everything, uh, just like uh, our consumer market, our refrigerators, our, our light bulbs, etc., are all connected today. Uh, as the same is true for uh, you know farm implements and even the plants themselves uh, will one day they be connected, if you will, in some way. Purdue is working to figure out how to handle the vast amounts of data going over the network. Edge computing is one of the answers. When did you start um, doing this sort of data collection? Oh, we've been doing it for many years, but it's just recently that we've had to do it at this kind of scale. One of the uh, questions that we had, if we're producing that much data, how can we minimize uh, the amount of data we have to transfer over the network? Because it's so big, uh, it can take time, right? So, uh, we determined that edge computing was required. So at the site where the sensors are generating the data, we do some pre-processing, then take the value data or the, or the data extraction and move it into uh, you know, high performance clusters or, or whatever. There's too many farmers today that aren't data driven, just like the rest of us. You show me the value kind of empirically, right? uh, then um, you know, I'll give it a shot. Purdue's Agronomy Center for Research and Education, known as ACRE, is a 1,408-acre research farm where they're using IoT sensors to test a plant's molecular responses to various factors such as water, fertilization, and soil. Let's call Andy and get, uh, let's call Andy and use the shielded sprayer then. We're Purdue's College of Agriculture's outdoor laboratory. We're more than a farm, we're a farm that's also a research facility. So about half of our resources go to uh, genetics and genomics, that's studying the plants and helping domesticate them and breed them to be more useful for humans. The other half of our resources go to crop production and environmental research. Traditional production agriculture has really accelerated a lot in the last few years with the use of technology. Technologies entered the, the, the chemical side of agriculture with fertilizers and pesticides, and now we're kind of entering a new phase where a lot of the technology is going into the genetics of the plants. The IoT sensors at Purdue help researchers create better plants. Some of the sensors even record typical things that a weather station at an airport might measure. These include air temperature, wind speed, and rainfall. The sensors also record the amount of solar energy that the sun delivers, since the sun is the engine of photosynthesis. This part of America was primarily hardwood forest, great hardwood forest. And right here where we're at, at Purdue University in West Lafayette, we're at the point where the great hardwood forest met the grand prairie that stretched to the west. Yeah, so this uh, uh, high organic matter prairie soil is uh, three, four, five percent organic matter, and that gives it a good dark color as it gets wet, it gets darker. And if you compare that to the brown or red soils of southern Indiana that are millions of years old, developed under forest, there's a lot of difference in them. So. We're recording things with instruments like the sugar content of the plant during the day. The more the sun shines on the chlorophyll in the plant, 
the more sugars it produces. So we can determine plant health or plant efficiency by uh, monitoring sugars during the day. The student might have a selfie stick with a, re with a recording device on the end of a selfie stick walking over each individual plant. Or we might have a device fly over the fields like a drone or an unmanned aerial vehicle. We could have recording devices on a wheeled uh, device that goes up and over the crops. We could have uh, instruments on a Cessna or a satellite. We can collect the data of a lot of ways. So we're working with the engineers at Purdue to help us determine the most efficient and the best way that we can collect our data. We're, we're using technology to, to improve the efficiency of agriculture, the accuracy, the safety of the food supply that comes out. We can record where we plant items, where we put on pesticides. We can prove where we shouldn't have put on pesticides with our recording devices. We can use that technology to create a better record for our agriculture production. And we're really hoping that the consumers that want to know where their food's coming from, that we, we can create a, a, a better uh, path on this is where your food came from, all the way back to the field. Food tech isn't just being used in labs and test farms, but in actual working farms such as the third generation Crafton Farms in Tennessee, which is a co-op for Land O'Lakes. All of the things that we'll talk about today are tools. Uh, it's not a, a set way of doing everything. There's a, there's a multitude of things that you can actually use. It's just picking what actually fits, fits you that you can tailor to your farm. So if you had 50 fields, it takes a long time to look over 50 fields, say if they average you know, 40 or 50 acres a piece. Uh, and that would take a long time to actually get out and walk and look at those. Uh, so with some of the technology, we can actually pinpoint fields, being able to say, okay, so on this day, if we put out anywhere from 50 to 140 units of nitrogen, we're gonna lose $29 by doing that, so that's not cost effective. So the one that's actually trending ahead or has more vigor on the on the iPad, uh, you would go look at that one because that could actually be weeds or it could just be the crop looks better. The one that's falling behind could be it needs more, needs more nitrogen, it needs more fertility or uh, it was planted really wet and it's just not growing very well. So now you've taken that 50 fields and you've, you've shrunk that down to maybe seven that you really need to look at that day. What we're looking at here would be, uh, so there's wheat over in the field on the other side of the shop. So this is what the wheat actually looks like from a satellite image. So the darker green is the better wheat, uh, the yellow is a little bit uh, smaller wheat, and this actually didn't have wheat on it, so that's why it's showing up red. So it's picking up just vegetative growth or just biomass that's in the field. So we know this isn't planted, but we know we want to figure out what's going on there so we could take this image and walk out in the field and, and pull a tissue sample or actually do, the, uh, do the, the agronomy work, again, the boots on the ground. Austin Crafton and his dad, Johnny Crafton, were using traditional farming at their Tennessee farm until Austin convinced his dad to start using satellite imagery to monitor their fields. How has it changed even since when you were a kid versus what you see now? I mean, everything. You know, you used to have to hold a steering wheel when I was a kid, and now you just push a button to let go of the steering wheel, and it does its own thing, and you just ride and watch. I had to really push it on my dad, but he's getting more and more used to it now than what he was two or three years ago. Do you see it improving crop yields? Is it having a positive impact? Yeah, I mean, not so much yields as what cost efficiency mm -hmm. is what we're saving money by using variable rate planting and fertilizing. Farmers have been trying to figure out better ways to grow food for thousands of years. Using technology isn't without controversy, but science and technology will continue to drive food production forward to help feed the world. We think about corn, a crop that's native to North America. Corn for a long time was a wild plant. And then some Indians in Mexico started harvesting it and they liked it. And for thousands of years, by simple selection, the Native Americans took a crop from Mexico, and by the time Christopher Columbus landed in the Americas, there were hundreds, maybe thousands of different varieties of corn. Then, about 125 years ago, 
we got into hybridization. We figured out there's more to corn than corn. There's pollen from the tassel, and there's the uh, silks that come out of the ears to accept the pollen, and we created hybrid corn. And double cross corn really revolutionized the production of corn in America. And then in the last century, we got into GMOs. So that's the fourth level of domestication. And now we're using genetics and we're identifying genes that are already in the gene pool and trying to, to, to utilize them as well as using modern methods of breeding that aren't as controversial as GMO. But the fact of the matter, every advancement in te technology, uh, you hope that universities like Purdue can help sort out the benefits from the disadvantages and we can continue to advance. So every advancement in technology uh, has consequences. The great thing about the, the university system in America is we're trying to use unbiased research, science, to help advance that technology and prove that it's more productive and safe and, and society will always have to answer those questions. Is it safe? Is it moral? Does it have value?